Hi, welcome back to Examining Life. My name is Amanda, and today I am at the University of Ghana with Dr. Trure. And so today we're going to be discussing your paper, An African Normative Framework of Healthcare, A Case for Ghana. Would you like to give a little bit about your background and a summary of the paper? Well, I'm a lecturer in the Philosophy and Classics Department mm -hmm. here at the University of Ghana. And uh, one of my areas of research and areas of interest is um, precisely in bioethics. This paper has something to do with um, clinical bioethics. So what are the ethical principles that need to be applied within the context of healthcare? And especially given that there is a particular cultural context and this culture has evolved with its own ethical notions, normative frameworks, which need to be studied and applied in a way that reflects even global standards so that when people recur to our healthcare system, they are treated well, but they're treated well within a framework which they can identify with. I start off with these two examples. The first example has to do with a lady who basically drove into a hospital in Ghana and due to her health error in healthcare delivery, this person lost their lives. And unfortunately, people do not resolve problems in the way one would expect, perhaps, perhaps from a Western framework. If you push things along the Western framework, because normally you would say, okay, let's probe into this, even if need be, we'll sue for damages, and um, Whoever made the mistake has to be held responsible and they have to pay for it. That would be the normal sort of like Western conception. But here there are many other values at stake. Yes, it is true it was due to a medical error, but at the same time, the person who committed this medical error was actually working in conditions that were very difficult, which do not justify the error, but they attenuate the error because the person was working under extreme conditions. I mean, where you have a hospital where there is no oxygen, then it is not just the fault of the nurse who actually applied a semi-empty oxygen tank to somebody, mm -hmm. that is because the resources are not available. But then once this happens, the other thing is, um, people here have a framework whereby the important thing is not so much to punish somebody because an error has taken place, but rather to see how can we work towards avoiding these things happening. And avoiding these things happening basically is to try and see whether you can build a stronger framework. Also includes actually, to some extent, rehabilitating the person who has committed the error. So in this case, the ideal was not so much to make sure that this nurse perhaps is fired because she committed an error or her license is revoked but to see what can we do to make sure that this person does not repeat this error again. So these are some of the things that we're talking about here. Demanding ethical standards, yet at the same time, respecting those values of social cohesion that actually keep the society together. Yeah, you mentioned multiple times the importance of communitarianism in Ghana. Touch on that a little bit and how it relates to like the healthcare system. Now in bioethics, one of the main principles of bioethics um, as it is taught in many universities, the first principle that is often referred to is the principle of autonomy. Now, the principle of autonomy, which then leads to informed consent, disclosure, and many other things that follow from there. Now, the principle of autonomy is important because people need to know and they need to have the right to make choices. And that saves patients in hospitals from becoming victims of medical paternalism. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a sound principle. Yet at the same time, we have a context here where values like trust, mm -hmm. values like solidarity, like empathy are very important. Yeah. And people would want to trust their healthcare providers. It is not just because they have given they've signed an informed consent that builds that trust. So it is also important while we're pushing for respect of autonomy and informed consent to ensure that those relationships that guarantee trust in persons and institutions also exist. 
And we even have cases, especially in the rural areas, whereby patients who are asked to actually make choices will refer back to the healthcare practitioner saying, you are the practitioner and you ought to know, why are you pushing the burden of the choice on me? I would like to trust you to be somebody who is interested in my well-being. You have received the training and you are supposed to know and so you should help me decide. Now this would seem to contrast with the autonomy model and the fight against paternalism. But here you have the case of a patient who's actually asking for paternalism. The problem of paternalism in itself is, yes, it has a negative connotation, but if we go back to the etymological roots of a paternalism, it's, I mean, it comes from pater, which means father. When we have a situation of abuse of paternalism, it is the pater who is not actually exercising his role as a good father. And the way to solve that problem is not by taking away power from the pater, but asking why the pater is actually not exercising a good role, and therefore the person to be corrected would be the pater. We need to actually include in our training of healthcare personnel the sense of responsibility and the attention towards the well-being of the patient and not towards just their own careers or their institutional or corporate interests. We start off with a situation whereby there is a, a structure of a certain form of epistemic injustice. Okay. Right. So, um, assuming I am somebody who does not even know about kidneys because I haven't really even received formal education, you cannot go to the doctor and within 30 minutes of a visit become an expert on kidneys. This puts a greater responsibility on the doctor to make sure that the doctor does not take advantage of your epistemic disadvantage to do what he wants or what she wants with you. Right? So it puts a greater moral responsibility on the doctor. And that greater moral responsibility cannot be solved by just throwing an informed consent that you're saying, well, you have agreed because you are responsible, you are an autonomous being. And no, that's not right. That's where I'm going. What role, if any, does politics play in the healthcare system? What might insurance be like if a system is here? And also, does politics play a role in the infrastructure of the healthcare system? Is, and is that partly a reason as to some of these difficulties? Well, yes, politics plays a great part in the healthcare system because we have a public healthcare system. And there's free healthcare for every citizen. We have it because we have the National Health Insurance Scheme where every citizen is insured and at least up to a certain level of health care is guaranteed to every citizen. And that was a political decision and the organization that runs it is part of the government. So yeah, there is politics in it. However, the problem is one, lack of resources because it is one thing wanting to grant health care to everybody and it's another thing, being able to afford it. And if you live in a, a country that has limited resources, your ideals and your goals may be high, but your resources are not capable of sustaining it. That creates some problems that there are health centers that are not well equipped. And we cannot guarantee quality in all the centers. However, I must say there has been an improvement over the last I mean, decade or so that I've been following this, there is an improvement and we just pray that the system continues to get better. But yes, um, now, is there a negative side of politics to it? Yeah. Remember, partisan politics tends to be adversarial. So decisions can be arrived at through people pushing their ideology, so that, that can have an effect. Yeah. But on the whole, the dysfunctions are more, lim are more linked to the lack of resources, material resources, mm -hmm. facilities, mm -hmm. which can make sure that everybody has access, and human resources. And if you look at the proportion of uh, doctor to patient, I think in the country, we are over 6,000 citizens for a doctor, whereas in Europe, in many countries, we are around two to 300. So that in itself says a lot. What needs to happen in order for Ghana to have more resources or enough to uh, fill the demand? 
Ghana is supposed to be a middle income country. Let's say the average income for every citizen is not more than $2,000 a year. If the economy were bigger, there would be more resources. But how do you make the economy bigger? What do we have? We have a country lives on exploiting natural resources. So gold, oil, and of course the farming of cocoa. Those are the three main things. Those are things that we need to manage well. And then remember something too, um, especially when you're talking about natural resources, you just can't multiply them. There is a limited availability. Yeah. And what is more, you need to use them in a sustainable way because you just can't go mining everywhere or digging up everywhere because you will have environment, environmental problems as well. So they have to be managed well. And then, um, you know, we also have the fact that, I mean, the population is very young. More than 50% of the population is under 30 years old. Now, this in itself is a resource, but at the same time, it can also be a problem because we need to have a bigger economy that can create jobs for these people to be gainfully employed and then the economy will, as it were, turn around. But anyway, I'm not an economist, I'm a philosopher and an ethicist, so <laughs> I leave the economic theory to other people. Um, you yeah. mentioned, I believe this was your conclusion, that the ethics that are necessary for healthcare workers to learn should be communicated through stories. I was wondering, like, would those be incorporated into stories that already exist or would new stories be created that have these ethics in them? Are there any stories that already have these ethics in them? Um, well, in the first place, what I, the point I wanted to make there is this, you know, people tend, or in other parts of the world, we tend to try to push ethics through legislation or through human rights discourse. That is fine, but what the point I'm trying to make is that Ethics is bigger than law, and there are certain aspects of ethics about you know, looking for the good that cannot be captured in fixed laws. Traditionally, how do people acquire an ethical sensitivity? One of the ways of acquiring an ethical sensitivity within the traditional setting here is through storytelling. So all the ethnic groups have these stories that kids are told from childhood, they know how to repeat them. The Anansi stories, for example, among the Akan, always end with some um, lesson about how if you are greedy, you will end up you know, in a bad way at some point, even though it may seem that if you're so selfish, you may thrive at some point, but in the long run, it will not work. So building into that, so part of our ethical education is actually through art, through storytelling, and you know, through proverbs, sayings, and we need to use all those instruments in today's context to help people acquire greater ethical sensitivity. So this is what I'm appealing for, um, I'm saying, yes, let's teach students in the health and allied sciences. Yes, I can spend my time teaching you this is utilitarianism, this is this theory of ethics, this is Kant's theory, this is deontologism and all that. Yeah. By the end of the day, I need to bring it down yeah. into lived experience and storytelling allows us. Mm -hmm. And also narrating real life experiences which help you, as it were, to move out of the theoretical apparatus and try to put yourself in the, in the shoes of the, of the person who is taking the decision. And it helps to fine tune your capacity to capture the ethical nuances of what you do. What are some of the ethical lessons that you would incorporate into stories, specifically as it relates to healthcare? Take, even if we talk about the Anansi stories, I all centered around the fact that you can be cunning, you can be smart, try as it were to outmaneuver everybody and always work to your own advantage and if you do that you may seem to succeed but at the end you will fail so a better way to live is to try to build a society that is more empathic values like compassion solidarity and all that so th that is an example okay. right so yeah. you're drawing up the values mm -hmm. and you can even use a negative example to show how it is better to live by embracing certain other values that are more communitarian, that are more embracing. Um, so my last question, 
has to do with religion and re like the religious role in the healthcare system in Ghana. I am aware that most individuals are religious in some form. And in the examples that you gave, the two patients who passed away due to what some would label as malpractice, their family members seemed to interpret that as it was God taking them because it was time kind of thing, instead of kind of recognizing the challenges that are actually in the system. But if the challenges are not recognized, there's a certain like, I don't know if it's denial, but if, if there's no recognition, it's hard to make progress and to change that. So if you want to touch a little bit on the role of religion in society as it relates to healthcare. Now, the belief that it is God who gives life and it is God who takes away life can also, to some extent, make people avoid actually investigating into cases of health malpractice. That is problematic. People would say, well, it doesn't matter if within a religious framework you are destined to die, even with the best doctor you will still die anyway. Let's try and accept the fact that we are human beings who are destined to die. We don't want to die, but dying is part of the human experience. So sometimes this plays in a negative role and people do not demand for greater accountability when errors are committed. At the same time, I don't think the solution lies in actually denigrating the religious dimension because the religious dimension helps people to, to face their health problems. On the one hand, it creates a framework of support. Religion in itself to having hope can actually help conditions of physical ailment when pa patients are hopeful and you know like they collaborate it can actually help in the curing process okay right. so more of like a mind over matter kind right. of thing yeah almost. mind over matter if you want to look at it that way that if you want to look at it from a purely secular way you can see it that way um religion it's also such that people actually live religious experiences within community and that community also helps to support people in times of suffering. So there are many good sides to it as well. Of course, there is a negative side, but there are good sides to it. So it's not just a question of eliminating it all together. I mean, religion gives people perhaps even a, a better framework, and this is a double-edged sword, to be able to accept suffering. I mean, I believe that one of the greatest um, dangers of Western society is the claim that you can actually save people from suffering. The West hasn't succeeded. The highest category of medicines that is consumed by the Western world are medicines that are altering your humor in terms of ansiolytics and medicines that are linked to, you know, like keeping your spirits up. Why can a society that is so wealthy and so, in theory, so healthy need so many things? There is something wrong with it. And these are things that religion, to some extent, actually offers some solutions there. If you go into many health centers and healthcare facilities in Ghana, you find that um, before the day starts, people actually meet and pray, the workers and the nurses. And yeah, I think people should not be forced to do it. But if they want to do it, I think it's a good thing. Let them do it. Puts all of them in a better disposition to work together yeah. for a common goal of healthcare. And I think it's a good thing. Um, thank you very All much right, for you. speaking with All me. Right, thank you.